Henry VIII might have been known as a bad husband with a hot temper who straight beheaded a couple of his wives, but he was also a surprisingly talented musician and was an animal lover. Henry was a complicated man. Today, we're going to talk about some strange facts that you didn't know about Henry VIII. But before we dive uh, head first, be sure to subscribe to Weird History. Now, second verse, same as the first. I'm Henry VIII, I am. Henry VIII kept a tight circle of royal servants, but none were closer to the man than his groom of the stool, whose duties included taking care of all those royal duties. Servants who wished to be the physically closest to Henry coveted this highly sought after position, granted to only four people in Henry's entire reign. Not only did they help dress and undress the king before and after his royal toilet business, they also controlled access to the monarch and even some of his finances. They even managed to have power over a stamp of the king's signature, a powerful financial tool. Though an athletic and svelte man in his earlier CrossFit days, once he hit 40, our big beefy boy really let himself go. He chunked out so much, weighing an estimated 400 pounds, he could no longer get on his horse without the aid of a crane. A crane was used to hoist Henry up and drop him into his warhorse's saddle. Some scholars believed he required the use of an early version of the wheelchair to get around. It's reported his waist had ballooned to over 50 inches, or the same number of horses who were probably immediately crushed upon drawing the short straw of Henry's warhorse. For longer than comfortable for most kings, Henry didn't have a legitimate male heir, and in his panic for one, came up with a disturbing backup plan. Though he had no son with his first wife, Catherine of Aragon, he had an illegitimate son by his mistress, Elizabeth Bessie Blount, or a real Jon Snow Game of Thrones situation. Henry Fitzroy, or old-timey for son of the king, was named Duke of Richmond and Somerset. Henry Fitzroy was there to ensure the country didn't descend into war again over Henry VIII's lack of producing a son with his wife. But Henry VIII wanted to resolve this whole thing by making the bastard Fitzroy the next monarch with the boy's half-sister, Mary, as his wife. This gross sister-brother marriage got the green light from the Pope, who I guess had a say in matters like these and failed to come up with the correct conclusion of, nah, that's gross. Fortunately for mankind, Fitzroy married a different, non-related woman, possibly rushing into marriage to avoid marrying his sister. Classic Fitzroy. Henry Fitzroy died at the young age of 17, leaving the door open for Henry's legitimate kids to take the throne and his sister free and clear to marry not her brother. Henry VIII had a famous temper, which is a kind way to say he was a man who enjoyed a good murder, including his wives and close friends, leaving many to ponder, what was up with that? Well, what was up with that was probably mental illness that resulted in the bloody slaughter of a bunch of people. Some theories suggested it was the pleasant combination of syphilis and brain injuries that might have led to his being straight crazy, but with hindsight, it could have been psychiatric conditions inherited from his family. His paternal great-grandmother, Catherine of Valois, Princess of France, was the daughter of famous mentally ill King Charles VI. Her family's mental health conditions were probably passed down through the generations to multiple British monarchs, from Henry VIII to George III and so forth. So don't blame Henry, he was born this way. Considering Henry VIII was a famously tyrannical man, it might surprise you to learn he was a huge animal lover, especially horses. Yes, Henry was a big horse boy, and our delicate fancy man proved to be surprisingly nimble on the horse, galloping through the English countryside with the best mounted knights in his kingdom. Kings, they really are just like us. His key contribution to the equestrian scene of the time was bringing the Italian sport of dressage to England. Dressage, for those unfamiliar, is the ancient sport of horse training, where the goal of the sport appears to be show complete control and dominance over the horse's movement. Henry excelled at this sport specializing in capriole, or giant leaps, making his poor horses jump super high in the air as if it were flying. Of course, the horse wasn't flying, with Henry's aforementioned weight issues. We hate to keep dunking on the guy, but a poet Henry was not. When courting his eventual second wife, Anne Boleyn, Henry penned her a bunch of love letters, playing it very uncool and coming across as very thirsty at his anguish over her coyness. This correspondence, which still exists, is just a touch on the sappy side. My mistress and friend, 
Henry regrettably opens with, I and my heart put ourselves in your hands, begging you to have them suitors for your good favor. Bleh, barf. In a separate, less safe for work letter, Henry writes, Wishing myself, specially an evening, in my sweetheart's arms, whose duckies I trust shortly to kiss. If you were thinking that duckies was a reference to Anne's boobs, you'd be correct. Henry basically drunk texted Anne, asking, You up? Hard to believe it'd be him lopping off her head with correspondence as romantic as this. Henry VIII wasn't a complete monster. In a way, he was a real Bernie Sanders of his time, ushering in a revolution in the healthcare industry of England and bringing the country into the Renaissance. As the founder of the Royal College of Physicians, he passed seven different laws to regulate the practice of medicine and licensing of physicians, laws that didn't have to be changed for 300 years, so Henry knew what he was doing. In 1540, Henry went further, pushing for one of the earliest laws to regulate drug pricing to keep apothecaries in check to assure they weren't gouging their clientele. Under his reign, London saw vast improvements of the sewer system due to an increase of supervision, thanks to his chancellor and, yes, future murder victim, Sir Thomas More, who was crowned the commissioner of the sewer. As Commissioner Sewer, More aided in the overall health of the country by making the water what it barely was before, drinkable. Way to get ahead in this world, Sir Thomas. If you should find yourself on a walk around London's famous Hyde or St. James Park, be sure to whisper a thank you to Henry VIII as you take in the lush greenery. During his reign, the king bought thousands of acres of green space for his personal use while chilling at his country estates. With this land, Henry went riding, hunting, and even enjoyed the occasional outdoor picnic, like a contestant on The Bachelor. Today, Henry's original recreational land for gallops and giggles still exists, thanks to Henry at St. James, Hyde, Regents, and Green Parks, all former places Henry owned as part of his empire of pastoral spots. He could be seen from spring to early fall, trotting around the country to check on his realm, but really just to hunt and play on his estates. As mentioned earlier, Henry's lineage could be described as dicey at best. The only illegitimate son he recognized was Henry Fitzroy, who died at age 17 without issue or having to marry his sister. All three of his legitimate children, Edward VI, Mary I, and Elizabeth I, would go on to rule England. However, none of them would produce an heir. Henry didn't have any confirmed descendants survive past the year 1601, the year Elizabeth would pass, and is 100% not the ancestor of any royals today. Queen Elizabeth II is descended from Mary Boleyn, sister of Anne and mistress of Henry VIII. Mary's two children from her first marriage were most likely not fathered from Henry, despite what fictional Natalie Portman starring movie The Other Boleyn Girl would have you believe, assuming you're one of the four people who remember that was a movie. Henry doesn't factor into the modern-day British royal pedigree at all. He only lives on in our hearts, which is nice for him, but memories can't serve as a British monarch. As the king who split from Rome and brought the Anglican faith to England, Henry was famously anti-Pope. Though it might come as a shock to learn when he was younger, Henry was a staunch supporter of Catholicism. Pope Leo X was so enamored with Henry's unflinching support of the papacy, he granted the English monarch the title of Defensor Fidei, or Defender of the Faith, a title that hilariously the rulers of England still have to this day, despite King Henry's later uncoupling of England and the Catholic Church. He sent tin from Cornwall to adorn the roof of Pope Julius II's new crib. He was even allegedly intended for the church himself before his brother died. Henry wasn't just a supportive participant in the Renaissance-era music scene, he was a little something of a musician himself. In fact, our dude was the total singer-songwriter package. He could write music, sing a lovely tenor, and could even sight-read. He didn't box himself in to strictly solo performances, though. Our man was known to not turn down a duet or two with friends. Just like the worst guy at a house party, Henry had a wide collection of musical instruments that boasted an impressive collection that included 154 recorders and 19 viols, each adorned with precious metals. 154 recorders? Feels like one too many. Was he providing the musical instruments for an entire elementary school's music classes? A big lute guy himself, Henry was also known to play the virginals, which is some kind of harpsichord. 
It is rumored that he even wrote the banger Green Sleeves as a young boy, a song that didn't hit the Billboard charts or its equivalency until after his passing, so probably just a story he told people, like having a girlfriend who goes to a different school. Henry famously had an older brother, and the first husband of Henry's first wife, who died young, but he also had two royal sisters, who were royal pains in his ass. His older sister, Margaret, was a real firecracker, just like her temperamental brother. So much so, she was shipped away to Scotland at the normally problematic age of 13. She managed to produce an heir, the future James V, but her playboy husband didn't live very long after. Having now become accustomed to a certain type of lifestyle, she looked to her loving brother, Henry, to bankroll her lux tendencies, which he didn't love. Maggie battled it out with the Scottish nobles over the right to serve as her son's regent, but eventually she fell in love and married the Earl of Angus, another Scottish noble. Henry's other sister, Mary, was no stranger to boy problems as well, having equally problematic marriage issues as her older sister, Maggie. Henry married her off to old man King Louis XII of France, but he, kind of predictably, passed away fairly quickly into the marriage. Before she was betrothed to Louis, she made a deal with Henry. If her first husband should pass away, she could marry the man of her choosing. Big mistake, Henry. Huge. She married his friend, Charles Brandon, a commoner nobody. Bros before hoes, Charlie. Bros before hoes. Henry was furious she would marry somebody without his permission or approval since he had no intention of keeping his end of the deal and now couldn't use marriage to his younger sister as leverage for himself. But in the end, love won, as Mary and Charlie stayed married until her passing. No thanks to her unsupportive brother. Maybe we don't let that guy arrange any more marriages. He's 0 for 2 and not very good at it. Never confused for a humble man, King Henry VIII was the first English king to adopt the title Majesty. Henry figured the traditional titles of Grace or Highness, fairly egomaniacal titles in their own right, weren't good enough for him as a king who reigned by the grace of God. He considered himself a royal cult, with the king as the divine leader of the country, and adopted the title of Majesty because divine cult leader Henry VIII was quite a mouthful. By 1520, foreign ambassadors were addressing the King of England as Your Majesty. Majesty carried additional regal connotations, deriving from the Latin word majestus, evocative of magnificence and near-divine glory hearkening back to ancient ages. A beautiful and complicated word that today is used mainly by people in sarcastic tones at cars who cut them off in traffic. Sure, we've learned a lot of deeply unsettling things about Henry VIII today, on top of the many horrible things we already kind of knew about him, but now we come to the most likable and relatable quality Henry possessed. Henry was a dog person. That's right. Like many kings of this era, and current single men, he had a plethora of pets, but the dogs were the real stars of the show. Henry adored his dogs, including greyhounds and beagles, who he would dress up in velvet collars and little tiny silk coats. To discourage them from biting humans, he kept the dogs strictly on keto, feeding them a vegetarian diet of bread and not meat. He was even known to shell out a pretty penny to anyone who brought back his beloved meatball and Beatrice, if ever lost. Those are names we've chosen to give his dogs and not historically accurate. To show his friendship during a time of war, Henry gifted Holy Roman Emperor and nephew of his first wife Catherine, Charles V, 400 dogs trained to attack enemies. Yeah, there were dog armies in 16th century Europe, but that's for another weird history. Anne Boleyn was the daughter of Thomas Boleyn, who at the time was a low-level aristocrat known as the Viscount of Rochford. After spending her childhood in the Netherlands and France, Anne returned to England in 1522, probably in her late teens or early 20s. Originally, she was set to marry an Irish cousin. Ah every young woman's dream. But these plans were put off. Instead, Anne secured a position as a maid to the first wife of Henry VIII, Catherine of Aragon. Queen Catherine was already a widow, having originally been married to Henry's older brother, Arthur, as part of an attempt to secure an alliance between England and Spain. When Arthur died just five months into their marriage, Catherine entered a peculiar state of courtly limbo. She was temporarily named as an ambassador to the English court, which allowed her to remain in the country, and technically also makes her the first female ambassador in European history. Not bad for an arranged marriage that blew up before takeoff. 
In 1509, as part of an effort to tidy up the situation, Catherine was married to Arthur's younger brother, Henry, to serve as his queen. By 1525, Henry had started to grow dissatisfied with the marriage, which had produced a daughter, Mary, but no male heirs, and he had started seeking comfort elsewhere. This initially included a brief affair with Mary Boleyn, Anne's sister, before Lucky Hank set his sights on Anne instead. Anne had actually already entered into a clandestine engagement with a nobleman named Henry Percy, an heir to the earldom of Northumberland. The king, upon hearing about Anne's relationship with Percy, ordered one of his chief ministers, Cardinal Wolsey, to put an end to the engagement. Wolsey obliged. You, uh, don't say no to the king, especially not this king. Some of Henry's love letters to Anne from this period have survived in the Vatican Library, of all places, and they speak to the genuine feelings the love-struck monarch had for his new crush. He referred to Anne as mine own sweetheart, and even circled her initials with heart symbols, which is entirely too damn cute for Henry VIII. It's like the 16th century version of replying to a text with three winking emojis. The letters also give us some insight into how the king viewed romance and love more generally. In particular, the use of elaborate wordplay and Henry's frequent references to himself as Anne's servant speak to his affection for what was known as courtly love stories, which focused on the delicate, chivalrous, and detail-oriented dance aristocrats would perform when they grew smitten with one another. He would also sometimes close his letters with a puzzle or a cipher, another common trend in contemporary tales of affairs between nobles. You know, toss a little riddle or word game in there to keep them interested. It's not a bad strategy. At some point in the mid-1520s, Henry decided to try and exit his marriage with Catherine and marry Anne instead. Big whoop, right? Famous people do this all the time. Except, ditching the old wife wasn't so simple back then. King Henry was a staunch Catholic, and the Vatican is super uptight about getting divorced. It's part of their brand. Henry had been such a profound defender of the Catholic faith in the face of Martin Luther's growing Protestant movement, Pope Leo X had granted him the title of Fidei Defensor, or Defender of the Faith, in 1521. A complete break with the church seemed unthinkable, so Henry's plan in 1527 was to ask the new pope, Clement VII, to annul his marriage to Catherine. His argument was that she had originally been his brother's wife, and thus the pairing was, to quote the king himself, blighted in the eyes of God. It's the old, see, the marriage didn't count in the first place, argument. The king sent a secretary, William Knight, to make his case directly to the pope, but Clement was unmoved by his interpretation of the events. Over the next few years, Henry directed Thomas Wolsey, who is now Lord Chancellor and Archbishop of York, to continue negotiating an annulment with the Vatican on his behalf. But by 1529, it was clear that no agreement would ever be reached. Ultimately, Henry charged Wolsey with treason for his failure and ordered him to return to London, but the Cardinal died of natural causes before he could complete the trip. History says natural causes. We say he was terrified of what Henry was going to do to him when he made it to London, so he checked out early. By 1531, Henry banished Catherine from court and decided to move forward with his plans to marry Anne, whether or not the Pope himself was personally on board. Though they weren't yet married or even officially public about their love affair, the duo enacted plans to solidify Anne's role at court. Henry brought her along to meetings with the French King Francis I in 1532, hoping to enlist his support for their union. He also granted Anne the man's title of Marquess of Pembroke, which not only made her a wealthy and important woman overnight, but did so independently of her father, whose land and titles would ultimately pass to his brother, George. Henry and Anne wed in secret in two clandestine services, the first in November of 1532 and the second in January of 1533. You know, one for the family and one for us. Both took place before Henry would formally dissolve his first marriage to Catherine at a hearing with newly named Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Cranmer, who was also the Boleyn's family former chaplain. There was no time to wait, as Anne was already pregnant with the couple's first and only child, the future Queen Elizabeth I. Still, they felt a need to remain out of the public eye, as public support still remained solidly with Catherine. Shortly after news of the marriage became public, Pope Clement excommunicated both Henry and Thomas Cranmer. This created a permanent rift between the Catholic Church and the Church of England, over which Henry personally assumed control. Hey, if they won't give you a divorce, just make your own church. 
Anne was crowned Queen of England in a coronation ceremony on May 31st and June 1st, 1533, which included a procession through the streets of London and a grand ceremony at Westminster Abbey. Oh boy, two days. Hope they had an open bar and a nacho cart. Clearly, they were finished keeping quiet about their new arrangement. Anne wore specifically made robes for the occasion, sewn with golden threads. And for the first time in British history, a queen consort was presented with St. Edward's crown, which had previously sat exclusively atop the heads of actual monarchs. The public response to their new queen was considered lukewarm at best. Following the coronation, Anne moved to Greenwich Palace and prepared to give birth. Elizabeth was born on September 7th, 1533. Her arrival was a great disappointment to Henry, who fully believed that having taken such elaborate steps to get out of his relationship with Catherine and replace her as his queen meant that he'd be rewarded with a son and heir. It's unclear why he assumed this. Maybe he'd spend every evening shouting, boy, at Anne's stomach? Sensing the overall mood at court, most of the royal physicians and astrologers had also been predicting that the child would be a boy. As Henry's first daughter with Catherine, Mary, was now considered a threat to young Elizabeth, she was stripped of the title of princess. Ouch. Despite the disappointment surrounding Elizabeth's gender, the couple were still on largely good terms at this point, and would often exchange lavish gifts. Though these, of course, included the expected jewelry and even large sums of cash, Henry was also an attentive husband who would delight Anne with her favorite activities, like archery or horseback riding. For her part, Anne was generous as well, and gifted Henry with fancy bedding and, on one occasion, a miniature ship that she had encrusted with jewels. It's gotta be tough to shop for the king. He literally has everything, so you have to get creative. Still, by 1534, the relationship had started to sour. While Anne's intelligence and strong political and social opinions had delighted Henry when she was his mistress, he sometimes chafed against them coming from his queen. A lost pregnancy by stillbirth or miscarriage further convinced him that his relationship with Anne was unlikely to produce the son and heir for whom he longed. The king started taking new mistresses, including Anne's own cousin, Madge Shelton. Double ouch. Public opinion as well had failed to turn in Anne's favor. Following the death of Catherine of Aragon in 1536, rumors started circulating that she'd been poisoned by either Henry or even Anne herself, which certainly didn't help her to improve her Q rating. Remember, the people loved Catherine and never warmed up to Anne, so Catherine's sudden and suspicious death didn't do the queen any favors. Around this time, Henry seems to have started shopping for new wives, including Anne's own maid of honor, Jane Seymour. Uh, the former Queen of England, not the star of Dr. Quinn, medicine woman. Anne had another miscarriage on the day of Catherine's burial at Peterborough Abbey, and this is widely considered to be the incident that doomed the relationship. While Anne was still recovering, Henry apparently told his closest advisors that he'd been seduced into marrying her by what was then known by the French term sortilege, which would basically be like a modern person blaming witchcraft, like she'd put a spell on him. Regardless, she was never charged with any supernatural crimes or formally accused of partaking in black magic. Henry's ultimate plot to get rid of Anne was entirely more practical in nature. Many historians believe Henry then turned over the job of getting rid of Anne to another key advisor, Thomas Cromwell. Following months of surveillance and intelligence gathering, Cromwell reported back to Henry that Anne was guilty of a number of adulterous acts, including an incestuous relationship with her own brother, George. Even though they were almost certainly lies, several men were arrested based on Cromwell's reports. The king wanted Anne gone, so the reports were just a formality. Anne herself was arrested on May 2nd, 1536, and taken to the Tower of London. In her final letter to Henry, dated May 6th, she claims total innocence of all charges, saying, Never prince had wife more loyal in all duty and in all true affection than you have ever found in Anne Boleyn. Several of her alleged lovers were put on trial over the course of the following days. All maintained their innocence, except one a Flemish musician named Mark Smeaton, who confessed to a dalliance with the queen, possibly after being coerced. The confession, not the dalliance. Based on the Treason Act, first instated by Edward III, adultery by the queen was considered an act of treason and punishable by death. So when Anne was ultimately found guilty by a jury that included her former fiancé, Henry Percy, the penalty would typically have been being burned at the stake. 
this was just for women. A man who was found guilty of treason was sentenced to be hanged, drawn, and quartered, like William Wallace in Braveheart. In a surprising flare-up of humanity, Henry felt like this punishment was perhaps too far, and insisted that his wife just get beheaded instead. But he wanted Anne to have a beheading fit for a queen. So, Henry arranged for an expert executioner to travel to London from Calais and deliver the death blow with a sword rather than an axe, which was considered faster and cleaner. Historian Tracy Borman later suggested that Henry's exacting instructions regarding the fine details of his wife's demise reveals a premeditated and calculating manner. Anne's sentence was carried out based on Henry's specific designs on May 19, 1536. Only 11 days later, on May 30th, Henry got married once again to Anne's former lady-in-waiting, Jane Seymour. As with his previous nuptials, the new ceremony was held in secret at the royal palace. Hank knows what he likes, and Hank likes secret weddings. Seymour finally gave birth to Henry's long-awaited male heir, Prince Edward, on October 12, 1537. The boy would in fact be crowned king just nine years later, following Henry's passing, but in a final twist, he would serve as England's monarch for just six years. In January 1553, 15-year-old Edward developed a fever and cough that gradually worsened. By July, he had passed away, leaving his sister Elizabeth I as England's new queen. Huh, maybe he should have thought about adopting. Henry VIII is one of history's most notorious figures, which is why he keeps showing up in Weird History episodes. Hank was responsible for the execution of over 57,000 people during his reign, and his revolving door of wives was so infamous it fractured the Catholic Church and became a Broadway musical. He, uh, wasn't a great guy. But Henry wasn't always a problematic monarch. Highly regarded as a young king, Henry showed promise. But things changed when he became convinced his wife, Catherine of Aragon, wouldn't be able to give him a son. An issue that became known as the King's Great Matter, which is a euphemism Catherine must have loved. Shortly afterward, he fell for Anne Boleyn and declared his marriage with Catherine annulled through a series of attacks against Catholicism, with heavy hitters like Pope Clement VII, Martin Luther, and Cardinal Thomas Wolsey getting pulled into the crossfire, until the Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Cranmer, finally ruled in favor of the annulment. You pretty much get your way when you're the king, but sometimes you have to work for it. But then, three years later, a single event would change the course of their entire lives. In 1536, Henry participated in a jousting tournament. During a bout against Sir Henry Norris, the king missed his opponent and fell off his horse. The startled, fully armored horse then fell on top of the king, like a wrestling match at a state fair. Naturally, this knocked the monarch unconscious. Anne, who was pregnant at the time, saw the whole thing, and the shock of Henry's injury, and the worry that he would likely not make it out alive, may have triggered her miscarriage, which would eventually lead to her ultimate fate. If you watched the Tudors on Showtime, you know where this is going. Henry survived but suffered multiple fractures in his legs. Although he made it out alive, his entire personality changed, and those in the know began referring to 1536 as the King's Annus Horribilis, his horrible year. Needing medical care in the 16th century was like gambling, except instead of counting cards, you count scars. Medical knowledge wasn't exactly cutting edge, and antibiotics definitely were not a thing yet. But did they still give you those little lollipops for behaving yourself? The king had to rely on his doctors to patch him up after the horse joust leg accident. For their part, the royal doctors saved Henry's life. But as we mentioned, medicine during this period was imprecise. Though he seemed fine at first, the king developed excruciating ulcers all over his legs. The doctors tried everything, but could do nothing to treat the seeping wounds. Oh, I uh, hope you weren't eating while watching this. Historians note that Henry's behavior and personality changes for the worse, shortly after developing these lesions. And just six months after the accident, Henry ordered the elimination of Anne Boleyn, spurred in part by her miscarriage, and trumped up via a series of explosive charges of treason and incest that were likely fabricated. He had his main man Thomas Cranmer annul the marriage before Anne was taken out, 
which was thoughtful of him. Then, the day after Boleyn's execution, Henry became engaged to Jane Seymour, marrying ten days later. Seymour gave Henry a son, but perished during complications from birth. And Henry, dealing with all of this alongside his festering ulcers, started putting on a lot of weight. Royals have a reputation for overeating and excess. Henry VIII was no exception, but he was very active for much of his life. He loved sports and participated whenever he could. In his 20s, Henry was 210 pounds with a 32-inch waistline. That's not even big enough to be a defensive lineman. Guess he didn't love sports that much. But he could barely exercise after developing leg ulcers. And while he tried to keep up public appearances, in his private life, he knew it was bad. Henry wrote to Thomas Howard, 3rd Duke of Norfolk, in a letter, To be frank with you, which you must keep to yourself, a humor has fallen into our legs, and our physicians advise us not to go far in the heat of the day. So Henry indulged in eating, drinking, and terrorizing the kingdom instead. Part of Henry's plunge into the excess included writing what was called the Ordinances of Eltham, a stomach-bursting description of what the king expected to eat every day, which included around 20 gallons of beer and wine, all matters of edible birds from pheasant to quail, and the simply stated butter and eggs. He basically ate his way through an entire cheesecake factory menu every day. His behavior ravaged his body over the course of a decade. By 1546, Henry gained so much weight he had to be transported in wooden chairs, and he could no longer lift himself, requiring a hoist to be lifted onto his horse. That horse must have really hated his job. In the end, Henry's final suit of armor showed he weighed over 300 pounds and had a 52-inch waistline, so maybe a last-round pick for a low-seated team. But the leg ulcers weren't the only contributing factor to his health problems. While the many fractures he sustained during the jousting accident were a primary cause of his leg ulcers, Henry's clothing choices didn't help matters. As a young, handsome king, he liked to show off, especially his calves, handsome Squidward style. He even participated in calf muscle bulging contests in the 1500s, which sounds like a deleted scene from Top Gun. Hank's calves were so amazing that Venetian ambassador Justiniano Wiener once described Henry in writing as the handsomest potentate I ever set eyes on, above the usual height, with an extremely fine calf to his leg. Just imagine Justiniana's diary. Naturally, Henry VIII couldn't resist highlighting his lovely legs, wearing tight garters around the top of each calf, even continuing the practice after his injury and decline in health. Today, we know that tight, constricting clothing can lead to blood clots, varicose veins, and thrombosis. But none of this was known at the time. It's entirely possible that Henry's clothing choices contributed to some of the leg problems he experienced later in life. Talk about suffering for fashion. Multiple leg fractures, a jousting accident, and tight garters are all likely causes of Henry's leg ulcers. But that didn't stop historians from seeking alternative explanations for Henry's severe ulcers. At some point, a theory emerged that the king had syphilis, based on his many maladies, both physical and mental, and his struggles to produce an heir. However, modern historians generally reject the theory. Although the king may have been a carrier of the disease, which could lead to him passing the disease to his wives who pass it on to their children, there is no record of him receiving mercury treatments or being out of the public eye for a long period. There's also no record of any of his wives being treated or showing symptoms, further discrediting the idea. Seeping leg wounds are chronic and painful and tend to be on the low end of anyone's wish list. There's no doubt that Henry VIII suffered greatly every day and his doctors took a unique approach to pain management, cauterizing the ulcers with burning hot irons. It wouldn't be medieval medicine if it weren't terrifying. Unfortunately, searing the pain away wasn't terribly effective, and the king's condition only worsened. If that weren't bad enough, 
there wasn't any anesthetic during these treatments, and the open wounds allowed infections to thrive. The condition got so bad that subjects could smell the odor from his ulcers three rooms away. Someone passed the royal clothespins. While historians have long since discussed Henry's leg ulcers, doing so during his reign was a bad idea and could have been a death sentence. The king wanted to be seen as powerful and strong, especially when his power was no longer checked by the Pope. Later in his life, Henry went a little crazy with beheading nobles, wives, and subjects alike. Among his list of victims were Henry Courtenay, first Marquis of Exeter, and Henry Pole, first Baron Montague, who were officially accused of treason. Henry had specifically created both positions for these two men, so you know he must have been seriously pissed to break up the three Hanks. Courtney and Pohl were officially charged with participating in what would become known as the Exeter Conspiracy, an alleged attempt to overthrow Henry VIII and replace him with Courtney himself. Historians believe the would-be coup was inspired by Henry's admonishing of the Catholic Church and yoinking of the Church of England's power. But Henry made it, somehow, even more personal. During their trial, a witness testified that they disrespectfully discussed the king's health. The men were quoted as saying, He has a sore leg that no poor man would be glad of, and that he should not live long for all his authority next God. He will die suddenly. His leg will kill him, and then we shall have jolly stirring. Henry was displeased, to say the least. So, he beheaded both of them. And honestly, they should have seen that coming. It was kind of his signature move. Questioning the king was obviously perilous. And as Henry VIII's legs continued to deteriorate, he would go on to whack many more people through the end of his reign. As a French physician who tried to treat Henry put it, In this country, you will not meet with any great nobles whose relations have not had their heads cut off. If festering wounds and Major B.O. weren't bad enough, King Henry VIII likely suffered from diabetes and hypertension as well. His constant eating and drinking worried his doctors. After all, consuming roughly 5,000 calories a day isn't good for your health. Unless you're the Rock. Or you're training to defeat the Rock. The doctors asked the king to cut back, but he adamantly refused. So the royal court began whispering jokes about his habits, saying things like, the king is very stout and marvelously excessive in eating and drinking, so that people worth credit say he is often of a different opinion in the morning than after dinner. In other words, Hank is grouchy until he's had his cheeseburgers. Today, we know Henry's extreme overeating leads to high risks for obesity, diabetes, and hypertension. These diseases are also known for making vascular disease, like Henry's leg ulcers, much worse. If the king suffered from any of these conditions while dealing with his leg ulcers, it could have worsened them. But did he? Historians and medical experts have different theories based on circumstantial evidence and retroactive observation, but no one knows for sure. Whatever the case may be, Henry's health problems grew progressively worse, ultimately leading to his demise from renal failure at age 55. Presumably, someone strummed a tender version of the Herman's Hermit song on a lute at his bedside. The England that Elizabeth inherited in 1558 was not exactly picture perfect. Her dad, Henry VIII, had done what no other monarch had done before him. He expanded the monarchy by breaking up with the Catholic Church and making England a Protestant country. And let's just say, it wasn't an easy breakup. That religious rupture with Europe had profound effects and led to conflicts between Catholics and Protestants. England was a mess, torn apart by instability and in desperate need of a hashtag imperialist navy-obsessed girl boss who wouldn't suffer fools. So after her father's death, Elizabeth took the throne as a young woman who was never supposed to be queen. She may not have looked it, but she was up to the task. Elizabeth wasn't a big dater. In fact, she was turned off by the whole marriage thing after the disastrous marriage politics of her father and older half-sister, Queen Mary I. Elizabeth's dad went through six wives over the course of his royal career, and Mary's marriage to a Spanish king inspired passionate outrage by her English subjects. Talk about drama. 
Furthermore, Elizabeth's situation was delicate. As a woman, she risked losing her independence, since she already had plenty of people who doubted her capacity to rule. Marrying a foreign prince was a dance in foreign policy. Marrying a subject was a dance in domestic policy. And also, dating is hard in general. Can you imagine how much harder it would be if you were a literal queen? Instead of getting hitched, Elizabeth branded herself as a virgin queen, and famously quipped, I will have here but one mistress, and no master. Even though many believed it was against the laws of nature for a woman to rule, Elizabeth proved them all wrong. By not marrying, she was able to preserve English autonomy and minimize factionalism amongst the English nobility. Or maybe she just wasn't a big fan of royal weddings. Either way, being single and ready to mingle served Elizabeth as well as England. Elizabeth was never really supposed to succeed the throne. She was her father's second daughter, officially at least. Though she was born legitimate in 1533, her standing in the royal family quickly changed when her mother Anne Boleyn fell from grace and was beheaded in 1536. Since her mom was executed, that made Elizabeth become illegitimate and thus unlikely to ever succeed the throne. Most thought she wouldn't become queen ever, especially after her father had a son in 1537. Henry VIII's line of succession kept growing, pushing his red-haired illegitimate daughter further and further down the line. But in a strange twist of fate, Liz's younger brother died in 1553. Suddenly, the crown passed to her sister Mary, causing Elizabeth to move up the food chain. When Mary married Philip of Spain, no kids were born. Because she had no children, Mary named her younger half-sister as her heir. So when Elizabeth finally became queen in 1558, she succeeded because she was the last heiress of Henry VIII standing. It was a real slow and steady wins the crown situation. Hell hath no fury like an angry queen. As queen, Elizabeth expected that her courtiers should show her respect. But her well-known vanity often made it difficult for would-be spouses to wed under Elizabeth's watchful eye. Several of her ladies-in-waiting, Bess Throckmorton and Catherine Grey, most notably, earned the queen's scorn when they secretly married their lovers without the queen's knowledge or permission. In fact, when Mary Shelton, the queen's second cousin, secretly married John Scudamore without the queen's permission, she suffered a broken finger when Elizabeth smacked her hand with her hairbrush. Yep, you heard that right. Queen Elizabeth I was a hairbrush-smacking control freak who controlled all her friends' marriages. Very normal stuff. Men were just as likely to get on the royal list as women. Explorer Sir Walter Raleigh fell in and out of favor with Elizabeth. Dashing and headstrong courtier Robert Devereux, Lord Essex, tried her patience and flouted her command so incessantly and treasonously that he ultimately lost his head. Whoopsie! The England that Elizabeth ruled was a golden age of the arts, exploration, and weirdly, piracy. England's chief naval rival was Spain, and English privateers stole buckets of goods and money from Spanish ships traveling to and from the Americas. Spain complained bitterly that English so-called privateers ransacked their ships, but Elizabeth did nothing to curb the exploits of men like Sir Walter Raleigh and Sir Francis Drake. In fact, she rewarded piracy. Elizabeth may have been vain, but she was also the perfect combo of beauty and brains. Full of energy, she proved to be a queen who liked activity and educational study in equal measures. She was extremely educated and well-read. She was fluent in no less than six languages other than her native English, Latin, French, Greek, Spanish, Italian, and Welsh. She was extremely educated and well-read. Not just a bookworm, Liz the Virgin was also an unapologetic jock. She was an avid hunter and horsewoman, and her court was famous for dancing the night away. She was, in fact, the dancing queen. If you had an entire country's wealth at your disposal, you'd probably want someone around to read your astrology chart whenever you wanted, right? Well, that's what Elizabeth did when she was queen. One of Elizabeth's most trusted advisors was actually someone who believed in alchemy and astrology. John Dee, or Dr. Dee as he was called, was one of the most respected men of science in the Elizabethan world. He was a mathematician, a scientist, an alchemist, and an astrologer whose consul Elizabeth routinely sought. In fact, Dee encouraged Elizabeth's imperial politics and was steadfast in his belief that the future of England was in North America. Sounds like a total Scorpio if you ask me. 
Dee wasn't just a man of astrology and science, he was also kind of a goth kid. His particular interest in the occult brought interesting characters into his life. For years, Dee turned to Edward Kelly for his own spiritual guidance. Edward Kelly, of course, was known to have secret occult knowledge and claimed that he could communicate with angels. Also, fun fact, Dee was probably the real-life inspiration for the character of Prospero in William Shakespeare's The Tempest. Just because you're known as a virgin doesn't mean you have to actually abstain from sex, right? Indeed, throughout her reign, Elizabeth hooked up with a list of royal adjacent faves. Most notably was Robert Dudley, the Earl of Essex, who was a companion and advisor to the Queen for several decades. Some scholars even believe that Dudley was actually the love of her life. Elizabeth was a known appreciator of male beauty and maintained flirtations with the Duke of Anjou, a prospective husband, Sir Walter Raleigh, and Thomas Haneage. As she aged, she made no effort to tone down her flirting. Towards the end of her reign, the young Robert Devereux, stepson to her former favorite Robert Dudley, rose quickly in her favor, despite the fact he was 33 years younger than the queen. Someone get a tracking device because this cougar is on the hunt. Meow. Rob flirted his way into royal appointments, and their relationship sent tongues wagging at court. He was as vain as he was handsome, however, and his star fell as quickly as it rose. Sadly, their relationship ended after he led a rebellion against Gloriana. Elizabeth broke things off with him by having his head separate from the rest of his body. As a teen, Elizabeth spent part of her time with her widowed stepmother, Catherine Parr, who had been her father's sixth and final wife. After the death of her royal husband, Parr had married Thomas Seymour in 1547, and Seymour moved in with his new wife and her 14-year-old stepdaughter. Anyway, Liz's new pseudo-stepdad started being really creepy. He harassed the poor teen by tickling her and accidentally walking in when she was nude. This caused quite a stir. Catherine caught on to the scandal quickly and gave it the kibosh. Furious, Catherine sent Elizabeth away in a bid to separate them. Tabloid-esque rumors followed the young princess, suggesting that she was pregnant with Seymour's child. The rumors, however, weren't true. But some speculate that her predatory stepfather relationship is what turned her off to future relationships with men. In 1554, Elizabeth's sister, Mary, who was the Queen of England at the time, became deeply suspicious of her younger sister. In the wake of Wyatt's rebellion, Mary feared Elizabeth could potentially usurp the throne. As a result, Mary imprisoned her sister in the Tower of London for several months in the spring of 1554. Elizabeth toiled away in that tower, locked up and miserable for months. The guilt of imprisoning Elizabeth must have eaten away at Mary because, eventually, she did name Elizabeth as her only heir days before her death four years later. The Elizabethan era is known as a golden age in English history, a time when the literary arts popped off. This is largely due to the fact that England was relatively peaceful throughout Elizabeth's reign. Due to peace throughout the land, this guy named Shakespeare was able to try out a few plays, and this other guy, Sir Edmund Spencer, tried his hand at poetry. Elizabeth also cultivated a literary court, and many of her courtiers were themselves poets, like Sir Philip Sidney and Thomas Sackville. Since Elizabeth ascended to the throne in the most unlikely of circumstances, it was natural she felt a little paranoid about her power. Intelligence was thus important to her security, and so she kept a spy master around, Sir Francis Walsingham. Walsingham was an ardent Protestant, and much of his intelligence was meant to limit the influence of Catholic Spain, and he had spies placed throughout the country. Walsingham also worked with his agents to code and decode letters, a true 16th century James Bond. The Babington Plot in 1586 was an attempt to assassinate Elizabeth I and intended to replace her with her Catholic cousin Mary, the exiled Queen of Scotland, aka Mary Queen of Scots. The Babington Plot was intended to allow Spanish forces to invade England. The plot, hatched by its namesake Anthony Babington and John Ballard, was as brazen as it was treasonous. Elizabeth's spymaster Francis Walsingham used his master spy skills and uncovered the plot, thwarting it completely. This did, however, lead to the execution of Mary, Queen of Scots. Mary was lured into the plot by Walsingham himself, who, in double agent style, lured her into the arrangement so he could gain evidence she was a tangible threat to Elizabeth's throne. Sneaky. 
Lover or hater, it's clear that Queen Elizabeth I's reign of England restored the chaotic turmoil-filled nation to powerful empire status. Between her navy building and arts encouraging, it's clear that Liz has forever cemented her place in history as one of the most memorable and hardcore queens of all time. Anne Boleyn was eating up a serving of her only sister Mary's sloppy seconds when she married her beau, famously nice guy husband, Henry VIII. Before Anne walked into the picture, her sister Mary was the lucky lady attached to this beefy boy. The two sisters worked together for years, both serving Henry's sister Mary, a different Mary entirely, when she was the Queen of France. Mary B. didn't mind a roll or two in the hay with her bosses, since it's rumored she was also the mistress of the new monarch of France, King Francis. You can't say the girl didn't have a type. According to a curious twist in the law at the time, trying to marry a woman whose sister you once hooked up with was considered incest. So in order to marry Anne, Henry had to receive a papal dispensation to say, this is fine. Despite all the hoops Henry VIII had to go through, the honeymoon period between Anne and Henry faded quickly, and he went back to his old dirty dog ways, starting more affairs with more women. Anne, who was quite the control freak, attempted to at least gain the upper hand by enlisting her own allies to spy on the king. She even ordered some to become Henry's side piece, to try to prevent him from finding somebody who would turn him against her. If your husband is going to cheat on you, it should at least be with a friend. And that's one to grow on. One of these lucky ladies just so happened to be her cousin. But as it turns out, your husband sleeping with your cousin was not any better than if he were sleeping with a rando street lady. And to boot, it didn't make Henry treat Anne any better. Not cool, Henry. Anne had a lot of catty enemies and some of them started spreading some shade towards our girl Anne, that even her own mother slept with her husband. One even went as far to spread the rumor that Henry was intimate with all three Bolin women, the mother and her two daughters. In bowling, that's referred to as a turkey. Another woman suggested that Anne should be burned at the stake since her husband cheated on her with so many relatives, which as far as burning someone at the stake feels a little misguided. And then there was Nicholas Sander, a Catholic priest who was not a fan of Anne. He started a rumor that Henry's second wife was actually his daughter, which is a very unchristian thing to do. For what it's worth, the mom thing never panned out. There was no evidence that Henry had an affair with Elizabeth Boleyn. Probably just the classic will they or won't they TV sitcom back and forth between man and mother-in-law. Moving on. Anne had her fair share of enemies. One major antagonist was Henry's first wife, Catherine of Aragon. Anne was taking the jealous wife routine to the extreme, plotting against Catherine, who also happened to be her old boss. When Catherine bit the bullet in January 1536, it was reported that Anne skipped the traditional solemn black garments, opting instead to go for a bright, cheery yellow to represent joy and happiness. Very few people can pull off yellow, so this was both rudeness and a fashion miss. During Anne's coronation in 1533, she wore a crown fit for a literal king, donning St. Edward's crown. This was the same crown her husband wore in the crowning ceremony with her mortal enemy, Catherine. Catherine was stuck with some dumb hand-me-down crown. The crown was a symbol that Anne and her unborn child were the real royal family now, further giving the middle finger to Catherine and her daughter Mary. Anne would later wear a crown made especially for her that surely could have been made before the coronation, but Anne was also a queen of drama. Once Henry VIII decided to go full Henry VIII and behead his wife, he did so with a modicum of compassion, opting to hire an expert swordsman. His hired man was from the French territory of Calais. The swordsman was there for a quick and easy lopping, as anyone could only hope for when in such a position. As opposed to slow and drawn out, that sounds, eh, not ideal. Anne's emotional state before her execution was described as both happy and dazed. She was even cracking jokes saying that she might be remembered as Queen Anne Lackhead after her death. Nobody said her jokes were good. After that, she got the light.
In order to justify her death, many rumors and folklore popped up immediately after Anne's demise. Rumors spread that Anne had a freak hand with an additional finger and moles all over her body. It wasn't until a century after Anne's death that a manuscript appeared proving the extra finger and moly body to be nothing more than fake news. The manuscript, written by Anne's superfan, poet Thomas Wyatt, was circulated by his nephew and described her body as having the normal amount of moles and the sixth finger as the beginnings of a fingernail, hardly a full additional finger. Henry VIII had a quirky little habit of beheading a wife or two, killing both Anne Boleyn and Catherine Howard, but he seemed to have a particular grievance toward this particular family since Anne and Catherine were first cousins. Anne's uncle, the brother of her mother Elizabeth, was the father of Catherine, who was 22 years older than Anne. Anne and Catherine were both enveloped into Henry's orbit by their uncle, the third Duke of Norfolk, Thomas Howard. A man who loved power so much, he was willing to throw any of numerous relatives into the path of royalty, later marrying his own daughter to Henry's illegitimate son, Henry Fitzroy. To him, it was all a game of royal family stratego. Anne's father pulled his strings and was able to get his loving daughter into the best courts of Europe, and he didn't even have to bribe anybody to get her in. In 1513, she learned how to be a diplomatic savant while serving Margaret of Austria. Her royal education continued as she served future sister-in-law Mary Tudor, Queen of France, wife of Louis XII. There, she developed a deep love of France, a difficult thing for some people to do. Fangirling over France became an asset to her when she stayed in the country after Louis's death. The new king of France, Francis I, was Henry VIII's fierce rival, but his sister, Marguerite of Angoulême was a brilliant woman and author that had a huge admirer in Anne Boleyn. So much so, she once told a French ambassador that next to having a boy, her greatest desire was to see Marguerite again. Which probably wasn't the best esteem builder for her daughter Elizabeth to hear. Not to make a shocking statement, but Anne's first love wasn't Henry VIII. Boleyn's heart first belonged to Henry Percy, heir to the earldom of Northumberland, to whom she was engaged. Although only the daughter of a minor official, Anne would boast of important connections, much like the worst person at a Hollywood party. They pledged themselves in front of a group of witnesses, or what sounds very much like a wedding. However, in a surprise twist, Percy was already married. <gasps> oh my, that dog. King Henry's advisor discovered the affair and shut it the hell down. We're guessing it was likely at the direction of Henry, who had his eye on sweet Anne for himself. The affair with Percy would later come back to haunt Anne, as affairs often do. Queen Elizabeth I rarely spoke about her mother Anne, who was murdered by her father Henry, which people probably had a few questions about. Though she had her father's famous fire red hair, little pieces of Anne also slipped into Elizabeth's whole vibe. She often would use her mom's old mottos, Semper Edom, or Always the Same. And in the 1570s, she wore a ring that contained little portraits of her mother and herself. Anne's love language was acts of service through the action of giving people she loved extravagant gifts they probably didn't need. For New Year's 1533, a holiday which traditionally requires no gift, she gifted her man a giant silver gilt foundation, crafted by Hans Holbein the Younger, a master artist and portrait painter. He would later also build a cradle for Anne's son in 1533, because a very fancy baby requires a very fancy crib. Anne was also a loving wife who supported her husband's hobbies, such as marrying various women and chopping off their heads. Oh, and also hunting. In 1532, she gifted him boar spears for his hunts, which is no gift card to Olive Garden. Anne's family was a real mixed bag, to say the least, running everywhere from middle class all the way to the most ancient nobility in England. Her dad's family had to work for their position in society. Her great-grandfather, Sir Geoffrey, rose from meager merchant to Lord Mayor of London, allowing him to purchase several manors which is nice when you really just need the one. Anne's father, Thomas, on the other hand, was the real hustler of this family unit. His wife, Elizabeth, was the daughter of the second Duke Mayor of Norfolk, a true who's who among noblemen in the kingdom. 
Though he got to some high places on his own merit and charm, it was his daughter who would go on to make him an earl and father to a queen. Anne's childhood home is still around today, and if rumors are to be believed, so is she a little bit. There are stories of Anne's decapitated floaty ghost that still hangs around Hever Castle, a place where her and her siblings spent some time as kids. There's even a photo of a ghost hand floating terrifyingly mid-air at Hever Castle, believed to be Anne's, but then again it could be any ghost's hand. Ghost hands don't have fingerprints. Other reports say Anne is haunting other better places where she once lived or even the Tower of London where she was executed, which would make less sense given this is probably not the place of her most favorite memory. So what do you think? Was Anne a part of history's rawest deals? Let us know in the comments down below, and while you're at it, check out some of these other videos from our Weird History.